Now, just talk a little bit about grass physiology and morphology very briefly, because it has to do with those growth curves. We see very different growth curves for things like orchard grass, tall fescue, perennial ryegrass, than we do for smooth grown grass and timber. Some of our grasses uh, have the behavior during vegetative growth, they will elongate the inner nodes, the, the, the true stem, they'll elongate those inner nodes during vegetative growth. That raises the growing point up into the zone where animals can bite it off or, or a haymower can clip it off. Regrowth is much slower <laughs> in those kinds of grasses, and they would be Timothy, smooth grown grass, reed canary grass, alfalfa, if you want to talk about legumes. So some of our species are not as defoliation tolerant as others. Now, if you talk about orchard grass, tall fescue, Kentucky bluegrass, these inner nodes remain compressed. Think of a, an old-fashioned radio antenna that elongates or, or compresses. <clears throat> orchard grass, tall fescue, Kentucky bluegrass, those inner nodes stay compressed, the growing point, which is right here, which is generating the leaves, stays down low, half an inch above soil surface, so animals can't bite those off. Regrowth is much, much more rapid. So you see different curves for these different species, and you also observe <coughs> changes in species composition as you go through years and years and years of severe, hard, frequent grazing. Some of those defoliation sensitive plants go oh, out. Wow. So here's an example. We've got orchard grass up here. We call that a short shooting grass. 30 hours after hay mowing, it's regrown an inch and a half. We've all seen that. Here we have Timothy, uh, 10 days after hay mowing. It's barely starting to show new leaves. Huge lag period compared to orchard grass. And again, you can manage them both. You have to graze Timothy the same way you would make hay out of it. You wouldn't try to cut it for hay every 10 days. You would leave it regrow for 35, 45 days. Orchard grass is a lot more flexible. Tall fest is a lot more flexible and it's manageable. Now, <coughs> Lots of thumb rules about grazing heights and residual heights and forage masses and so on. But one interesting way to think about pasture management, defoliation management to maximize production, quality, intake, um, suppression of weeds by productive canopies. Just think about the number of fully elongated leaves. We call them collared leaves. You can see the, that junction between the blade and the sheath. That junction is called the collar. When a collar appears on a leaf, that leaf has fully grown. It's not going to be elongated anymore. You count the number of so-called collar leaves or fully elongated leaves on, on a shooter or tiller. <laughs> and if you're in phase two, again, that, that high growth rate phase, high quality phase within a, a growth cycle, it's going to be three leaves for perennial ryegrass, three to four for orchard grass and tall fescue, five for smooth grown grass, timothy. We don't know the numbers for a lot of our other species yet. This is European, New Zealand, <coughs> Australian thinking, and most of what they deal with is perennial ryegrass. So we haven't extended it to our other species yet. But if you just count the number of collared leaves, you get a pretty good sense that these are appropriate stages for grazing. Pasture growth rate has been high, phase two. Forage quality is still high. We haven't gotten into the senescent uh, standing material. Plants in positive energy balance. Roots and shoots will regrow rapidly following foliation. Now, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of legumes in pastures. Some people say they're harder to manage because you can't spray for weeds. And there's some truth to that, and there's the risk of bloat. So we have to, to, to pay some attention. But ideally, many of us would like to see 30 to 50% of the pasture dry matter in the form of legumes. 
clovers, alfalfas, and birds put tree for them. Um, partly because we're getting free nitrogen from the atmosphere as the flavium sticks nitrogen and uh, that cycles from urine and manure back to the grasses. Um, but also we get higher quality diet, lower fiber, higher intake, higher individual animal performance. Lots of reasons to, to promote and facilitate ladies and pastures. <coughs> now, as we go through the season, we sometimes find with, let's say, orchard grass or Kentucky bluegrass that tend to go summer dormant due to the heat. We sometimes find we can offset that summer dormancy or summer slump of the grass by having a deeper the legume like alfalfa. If they have suitable soils for alfalfa, the alfalfa will grow at higher temperature than many of our cool season grasses and they'll sort of offset the grass loss. So another reason to think about legumes. <coughs> If you're interested in legumes, we have growing point um, architectural differences just like we did in grasses. If you think about light clovers, light clover, just like grass, has a growing point at the end of its stem, tip of its stem, but the stem is moving which way in light clover. Which way are the stems going in the light clover plant? Horizontal. Horizontal. So stolons, okay? So a stolon is just an above ground stem that's creeping horizontally on the surface. If it was below ground, we'd call it a rhizome, like in black grass or smooth grown grass or reed canary grass. But the stem, here's the stem tip, it's protected. If you turn this white clover 90 degrees, now you get red clover and alfalfa. And where are the growing points now? Up here exposed. So we have to treat red clover and alfalfa a little more gently than we do white clover if we want to stay in the stand. So again, part of the reason you see white clover encroaching and taking over in severely grazed overstocked horse pastures, for example, that can take it because we're not removing the growing points. These species can't take it. They have to be natural. Now, let's go back to grasses for a second. Part of the reason we have summer slump during July and August with grasses is most of our grasses, in spite of our best intention, most of our grasses are surprisingly shallow rooted. We like to think they go down two and three feet, and they do in the Great Plains for some of the warm season tall grasses like switchgrass and big blue stem and, and Indian grass. But unfortunately, most of our cool season grasses in this part of the country only go down. We're looking at soil depth here, zero to three inches on up to 12 to 18 inches. These are just weights of roots, total weights by these depth horizons. So we look at, let's, let's start with orchard grass. Most of the weight is in zero to three inches. Kentucky bluegrass, even, even worse in terms of being shallow rooted. Timothy is shallow rooted. Most of the weight, zero to three inches, a little bit more of a fraction, three to six inches, and then it really trails off six to nine inches and so on. There's a little bit more in smooth grown. Smooth grown's got a better profile as you go down to the depth. <clears throat> and we don't have the data here for tall fescue. Tall fescue behaves like smooth grown grass. It will have more of its roots down at six and nine inches, but still, we're lucky if we do 